Hi, everyone, and welcome to the 2022 History Detectives Virtual Edition. This session is sponsored by the newly renamed Grand Rapids History Center, which is part of the Grand Rapids Public Library and is located on the fourth floor of the main branch downtown. My name is Tim Glegg, and I'm a librarian here at the History Center. And today, I have the distinct pleasure of introducing Heather Edwards and her presentation, American Made, the Grantkowski House. Now, if you've done research here at the library, you prob probably already know Heather well. But those of you who don't, a brief introduction. Heather graduated with a degree in English and History from Central Michigan University, and then went on to get her master's degree in Historic Preservation from Ball State University. Since then, she has held positions at the Michigan State Preservation Office, the, history, or the City of Ann Arbor, and several other consultancies uh, doing historic preservation work. She then spent over a decade working here at Grand Rapids Public Library. And all this, I think, makes her a perfect presenter for this talk. More recently, Heather has uh, taken a position on the executive team at the Association for Corporate Growth, West Michigan chapter. House histories, I think, are not simply figuring out who designed it or the style or the date that someone slapped up some two by fours and shingles. In fact, I think for most of us, those kind of questions are a little bit boring. I think what Heather does so well in this presentation is show us that a house history can do so much more. A house history can also be the history of a family, a neighborhood, or an entire city. It can introduce us to how people lived and worked and worshiped. And it can take us to unexpected subjects and provide many unexpected insights. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn things over to Heather. And then at the end of the presentation, I'll give a bit more information on how to access the many great resources that Heather uses. For those of you who might be interested in tackling your own house history. All right, that's it, Heather. Take it away. Thank you, Tim. That was a really hearty welcome. I appreciate it. And I really did appreciate my time serving patrons here at the library. And I do love to do research. So this is fun to be invited back to talk about the first home that I lived in with my family here in Grand Rapids and got really interested in the research. So in just a few moments, I am going to be sharing my screen and I'm going to turn my camera off so you can see my screen. Uh, more fully and see the presentation I put together. It is a little older, but the nice thing about house history is that you can use resources that are historical in nature up to contemporary time and things aren't gonna change that much. You know, the history of it is not gonna change. Insights into that history, of course, will change over time. So I please enjoy this presentation that I put together when I worked here at the public library for a house history 101 session that we used to give. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen now. And I'm also going to go ahead and stop my video so that it isn't so distracting for anybody to look at the screen. All right, so this is the tidy little house that my family first bought when we moved to Grand Rapids in 2007. It's a 1939 hollow concrete block house that's faced with brick. It sits on the west side of the city off of Leonard and Walker. As we go through the presentation, you'll learn why the title of this particular slideshow is what it is, which is American Made, the Grant Kosky House. I'll be showing you the sort of resources available at the Grand Rapids Center for History um, here at the library that can help you research the social history of the property, whether it's residential or commercial. And as most research projects take shape, I'll be moving backward and forward in time as I follow the breadcrumbs to make a more complete picture of 1238 Mound and its first occupants. So the very first thing that I started with here at the library was something called the real estate card collection. The collection is made up of small index card sized documents that have a photo of the building on one side and corresponding information on the other. They're handy as you can determine the name of the plat and the specific lot number, the lot size, the name of the current owner and amenities. Sometimes if you're very lucky, the name of an architect might appear, but that's rarer. The real estate listing cards at the library have a span of approximately 1955 through 1996. 
though in a few instances, I found some as early as 1953 and as late as 1998. These were used by realtors before the advent of the online MLS system, so they were no longer created after the internet made searching by anyone anywhere possible. And a few caveats to this collection. There will be one card for each time a property is listed through a commercial realtor, even if that is relisted three months later, even if the sale is withdrawn, you know, it's always there. There are no cards for rural properties, nor for person to person sales or land contract sales. Uh, the collection here at the library contains cards from Grand Rapids and some other surrounding incorporated areas. So when I started researching my house in 2012, I found exactly one card from April 1997. This means the house was either not sold between the build date of 1939, or more likely, it was sold without using a realtor before the sale in 1997. And one really interesting note is that it was only about $80,000 then, which sounds really great to me right now. So after I had some information from the real estate cards, I turned to the city directories. And the city directories are like phone books, but they contain a lot more information. They provide the name associated with a particular address, but they also provide a very handy street index where you can search by the street address instead of a name and see who resided in a home over time. So working backward and forward in time, city directories can help you narrow down the date a building was built, who the first resident was, and how long that name was associated with that address. As you can see, during my 2012 research, on 1238 Mound, my husband and I had been listed at this address for two years. We purchased the house from our friend, Craig Johnson, in 2007 and were published as the residents by the time the 2008 directory came out. This sort of research took me all the way back to the 1939 directory listing for 1238 Mound, where I was able to confirm the first and longest residents were Frank and Clara Grant Kosky. Now it's standard in preservation research to name a building or a home after the first resident, after um, the main funder or sometimes the builder, which is why I have referred to, to 1238 Mound as the Grant Kosky house since I learned that. The next library resource I used was the Sanborn map collection. The library has a few Sanborn map books that are oversized and full color maps for platted areas of the city, but has many more map series available on microfilm. The library has even more access to these maps via the digitized link at their website, and they're worth using to create a more complete picture of your neighborhood. Sanborn maps were published for urban areas in a series. So this particular map was published after map makers surveyed the city in 1930 and then made edits and updates to that particular map in 1950. So if I zoom in here, you can see that the Grant Kosky house is located at 1238 Mound on lot 78 and that it is sited between 1236 and 1244 Mound. And that's an important detail for later on. The map offers you the footprint of the building as it was at that point in time. So you see a rectangular footprint with a D for dwelling and a one in the corner, denoting it's a one story tall dwelling and a small rectangle at the rear of the lot. So that one's a bit blurry, but the number one and the letter A on the small building refer to auto storage, again, a one story. So that's the house and garage as surveyed between 1930 and 50. And when we purchased it in 2007, it hadn't changed one bit. There were no additions or alterations to change the footprint. You might recall from the preceding slide that the house didn't show up in the directories until 1939. So this original series of maps from 1930 was updated in 1950 to show all the houses that sprang up here during the war and in the post-war period. Next, I wanted to know more about the neighborhood and the property before the house was even built. So I went to the library's collection of the Kent County plat maps. So there are several collections of these available in oversized book form and photocopied form. One of the earliest maps that shows where my neighborhood would eventually be platted is from 1907. At that point in time, the city boundary had not extended as far west as it is today. And so what became 1238 Mound was first situated on land owned by the W. Winchester estate on 25 acres in section 15 of Walker Township. So now that I had a good idea about the year my house was built, a little about the plats and the name of the first occupant, I wanted to know more about those folks, just who Frank and Clara Gronkowski were. 
I had no luck in finding any trace of Frank in the library's high school yearbooks collection in class photos or graduating senior photos, so I scratched that off my list. I started using the library's genealogy databases, particularly Ancestry.com. I didn't find much mention of Clara Grantkowski in my initial census searches, so I focused on Frank, because it is frustrating but true that you can find more by tracking men and paternal lines in many ways than you can by tracking women. I was having bad luck with the name Grant Kosky. I know that names are often misspelled, but I didn't know what sort of misspellings to look for. I finally found Grant Kosky in the 1920 census, and I'll zoom in for you here, living in the home of someone named John Grocktroop at 1701 Hamilton Street, Northwest. The highlighted name here is Frank's, but if you go three lines up, you see the head of household, John Grocktroop, and then Mary and Norbert, who are listed as wife and son. And indeed, Frank is listed as stepson. So as of January, 1920, Frank is a 21-year-old single young man living with John Grocktroop and his wife, plus a five-year-old boy named Norbert. As Frank was lifted, listed as stepson to the head of house, I surmised Mary must be Frank's mother and Norbert was his much younger half-brother. We know from this listing that Frank was employed at a furniture factory. So the series of Sanborn maps from 1930 through 1950 shows me that 1701 Hamilton is just about steps away from the Imperial Furniture Factory, which is where I assumed that Frank worked. Many individuals lived very close to where they were employed in this era before many working class people had personal or family automobiles. So going back to genealogy databases, I tried to make a more complete picture of Frank's life. Not having any hits on Grant Kosky other than the 1920 census, I instead followed the name of Grock Troop, specifically young Norbert. This was the key. In 1930, I was able to find Frank in the census living with the Grock troops, and I discovered in both 1910 and 1930, the record of his name was spelled with two alternative ways. You can see those on the screen. I also found him listed in World War I draft records with what appears to be the Polish spelling of his name. And this particular record confirms he was indeed employed at Imperial. Now, using both alternative spellings for Grant Kosky, I'd found in the 1910 and 1930 censuses. I dug back in to learn about Frank's birth, Eureka. Using one of those spellings, I found this in the 1900 census, Andrew Grant Thorkey. If you can see the name is spelled a little differently yet. The next page of the census, which is not included here, indeed shows Andrew's wife, Mary, and their infant son, Frank. So this is indeed Frank's father. And the address of 547 on Hamilton Street would definitely become 1701 Hamilton. So something every property researcher must know is if and when address numbers changed in a city. Indeed, in 1912, Grand Rapids Street addresses changed, some drastically, due to changes in the US postal system. The library has a special accompanying book to the 1912 city directory that shows both the old addresses in parentheses and the new addresses. We can see here that 547 Hamilton became 1701 and indeed it shows Mrs. M. Grant Kosky. This also tells us that Mary was living here and probably minor child Frank on her own. Otherwise, the listing would have been under Andrew's name. So what happened? Using more genealogy databases, directories, and newspapers, I discovered that Andrew had died in 1910. Frank was quite young, and he lived on Hamilton Street with his mother, then his stepfather and half-brother at 1701 Hamilton until his early 30s. So what was that Hamilton house like? I went back to the real estate listing cards that I could see what it might look like and how it might have changed. I found only a few cards. One is for 1953, the top image, and one is for 1966. So this was Frank's first home in the city across from the Imperial Furniture Factory. Now I wanted to know about, more about Frank's life. And city directories offer a bit more than occupant. They also tell you where someone's working. I started looking for Frank's occupation in the directories. So using directories, newspaper indexes, and newspapers on microfilm, the archival collections of the library, and genealogy databases, I was able to put together a little about Frank's life. 
He worked for a furniture industry in town most of his life, for a bit at Imperial and mostly at American Seating. And now you know why the title of my presentation is American Made. Here's a photograph from the archives at the public library showing the American Seating Senate in 1921. Look at that young Frank. He would have been only 22 or 23 years old here, and he'd clearly left Imperial Furniture and joined American Seating as a young man. But what is the Senate? Archival Collection 233 offers a wealth of information about the city's furniture industry, and much of my American Seating information was found there. This 1937 newsletter, newsletter from American Seating explains the system of governance of the company. Right after World War I, the company instituted a model of governance based on the US government system. The Senate was peopled by department heads or foremen, and this means at a very young age, Frank was already leading up a department at American Seating in some way. So here's the Cliff Notes version of Frank's working life in the furniture industry, most of it spent at American Seating. Frank died five years after his retirement when he was 70. A look through his and Clara's obituaries revealed the couple never had any children, so there was going to be no potential source of information to follow up on that end. So Grand Rapids development and history is deeply intertwined with the furniture industry. And that's a rich topic that we don't have time to delve into. But remember those Sambor maps? I was curious about where it was Frank went to work. So I dug back in. Here's an image from the 1912 Sandborn map with 1930 updates. This series is available on microfilm and the sort of darker portions you see correspond to when the surveyors actually cut and pasted changes into the maps over time. Like with residential properties, Sanborn maps for commercial or industrial buildings provide a ton of information. You can see here the complex for American seating takes up an entire map page and is full of important information for insurers and personnel alike. A brief aside about the Sanborn maps is their full name, Sanborn Fire Insurance Maps. That's exactly why they were created, to know the materials and coatings used in the building to gauge fire risk and liability for underwriters in urbanized areas of the US. There were other fire insurance map makers prior to the turn of the 19th century, but Daniel Sanborn cornered the market from about the time of the American Civil War on. This map showing American Seating's operations demarcates a dry kiln, the foundry, the steel plant, and even train tracks running up to the complex, among other important information. More than that, the next page of this map spells out what the company manufactures and then lists a slew of important factors, how many night watchmen are on duty, water tank capacities, the presence of a spring fed reservoir under the dry kiln and which buildings on the site have wet systems. It'd be very important if this building were to catch on fire to know exactly where to go to help stem that blaze. So as Frank, Frank spent the majority of his career American seating, I wanted to know more about the company. The library's collection of subject files gave me some background on the company. This particular publication was a promotional piece that displayed what the company manufactured and for which industries and provided a crisp rendering of the headquarters. So going back to the very large collection on businesses in Grand Rapids furniture industry, this image shows us a page from a 1923 American seating company handbook. And it seems to showcase the homes of some of their employees, mostly located on Grand Rapids West Side, just like the factory complex. And by looking through a number of handbooks and company publications, it was evident that homeownership was a point of pride among seaters. Here it tells us that 75% of the people who were employed there owned their own homes. The collection of American seating documents also provided a glimpse into employee life. The company offered an array of entertainment and athletic opportunities for workers and their families. Here's a cover of a typical Cedar magazine from the late 20s featuring an employee's child looking kind of rather devilishly at the snow person in the yard. And we can contrast that with the graphic and subject quality with a later edition of the Cedar. This one from 1945, showing an employee with a heap of pilot seats designed and built to support the war effort. Notice the slicker title block and stylized drawings of an urban cityscape reflective of that modern era. After learning more about the west side of the city and seeing many Polish origin names of American seating employees, I then turned back to the library subject files to learn more about the ethnic population over time. This particular subject file and ethnic groups 
has a handy undated representation of churches and associated cemeteries of the Polish Catholic faith community. You can see here in the zoom view that Frank lived on mound, the short vertical highlighted uh, street here near the cemeteries. He worked over at Ninth and Broadway up near the top of St. Adalbert's Basilica. And he was nearby the Polish Holy Cross Cemetery all of his life. That same subject file on ethnic groups for Polish Americans in Grand Rapids had a lot of documents that enabled me to understand more about the average Polish worker living on the west side. Most were German Poles and most were skilled laborers and employed in a variety of jobs related to the furniture industry. In addition, the land nearby Frank's house at 1238 Mound was once owned by Father Skory of St. Adalbert's and it became the city's Polish Catholic Cemetery at Holy Spirit. So continuing to move back and forward in time, I then wanted to know more about the land under 1238 Mound from a city platting perspective. The library's plat collection has a white on black copies of photo stats of every city plat. Using the city plat index available in local history, I found the history of that neighborhood. It was officially platted as the Highland Hills plat number one in 1925 on land purchased from the Edison family. Yes, relatives of that Edison. If you know this neighborhood, you also know there's a Highland Hills Baptist Church nearby and a street named Edison just across Leonard. City plats show one the neighborhood layout sans any buildings, which allows you to see the lots as numbered and also the street names as originally platted. The main change between the 1925 platting and now is that Parker Avenue on the left side of the screen is now called Parkhurst. Returning to the Kent County plat map collection, I looked further forward in time. So now we know in 1907, section 15 was part of a larger estate owned by W. Winchester. And we know that the Highland Hills number one neighborhood was platted in 1925. So by looking at this 1939 county plat map, when the Grant Kosky house was built, we see that the Highland Hills plat is indeed named and the neighborhood is still part of Walker Township, just west of the city boundaries. We'll zoom in here and you can see there's a Hillcrest plat right next to a Highland Hills plat is a bit blurred, but it's clearly there. Now it was time to dig into some more newspapers. The library has a very large collection of the Grand Rapids Press and the Grand Rapids Herald and others on microfilm. It's a real treasure trove. In the 1920s through the 50s especially, both papers contained sections related to the building and real estate industries. A search on 1238 Mound didn't turn up anything, so I thought, well, all right, what's the next resource? but then thought, well, why not search more for anything on Mound? It's not a long street, I'll see what's there. And then I found this article that I'm 99% sure has to do with the construction of the Grant Kosky House. So this particular article from July, 1939 explains a new method of concrete foundation pouring was employed, but at 1240 Mound. So why do I think this was the Grant Kosky House? The first Sanborn map we looked at from 1930 through 50 showed 1238 sandwiched between 1236 and 1244. So I think that before the house was completely built, it was temporarily addressed at 1240. The house to the south, 1236, is roughly the same vintage as 1238, but the house to the north at 1244 is definitely from the late 40s to early 50s. So this must be Frank Grankowski's house. One final research that the library can help a research point the library can help you with, but won't give you all the information on, is your neighbor. Our neighbor, Eddie, was a real wealth of knowledge about the Grant Koskies as he had lived next door to Frank and then just to Clara when she was a widow with his mother since 1966. So be sure to ask your neighbors what they know about your property. So I hope I have given you a decent overview of how to conduct house history and more specifically a social history of the home. Remember that this can be done with residential commercial property or industrial buildings and any of the latter you might have luck finding to detailed drawings notes on material suppliers or even architects and builders information. So I welcome Tim back. Thanks for spending time with me today.
Oh, thank you so much, Heather. That was really fantastic. Uh, I really enjoyed it a lot. Um, okay, so then before we wrap up, let's um, just take a few moments here and I can talk you through some of the resources that Heather used and how you can access them if you would like to. So uh, as Heather did, I'm going to share my screen and hide myself so that I am not too distracting here. Let's see here. All right, so before we wrap up, let me give some tips on how you can access some of these resources that Heather used, if you're interested in doing research of your own. So let's start with some online resources. What you want to do is go to uh, the main website of the library, grpl.org, and then you see this link right here. It's called Grand Rapids History. That will take you to the Grand Rapids History Center page, and it has all number of resources here that you are able to use. What I'd like to do is highlight this first link right here called Local History Research from Home. Go ahead, click on that link, and it provides a whole list of online resources that you can use uh, to do house histories. I won't go through them all right now, but I do want to highlight a few things. First, city directories. Uh, most of the earliest city directories for Grand Rapids have been digitized and are available either through Google Books or Hathi Trust, uh, basically from the beginning, 1856 uh, into the 1930s. So be sure to use these resources. Um, they have been technically digitized, so you should be able to do full text searching. However, the conversion process was not perfect. So there's going to be typos and other things, which means you'll want to do some of your own manual searching as well. But having access to these materials online is really, really helpful. Second thing I want to note here are Sanborn fire insurance maps. Now you'll notice uh, we have a link here to the Library of Congress website. It has nearly all existing um, Sanborn maps for Grand Rapids, and they are available for free. Uh, we are also very Happy and proud uh, to note that we have two maps here, the 1874 and 1878 Grand Rapids maps, which to our knowledge, no other institution has. So we have also digitized those and provide them online for free. Uh, but the thing I really want to highlight here is this FEMO, Fire Insurance Maps Online interface, which is absolutely fantastic. So if you go to that interface, you'll see that it acts just like a Google map that you might uh, use every day. You simply type in the modern address that you're wanting to look at, and it will put a little pin there uh, at the address. So I put the library here, uh, and then it will list all of the different maps that are available from all the different years uh, for that one location. It makes accessing this material, finding what you're looking for so much easier than having to manually go through um, the other maps through the other interfaces. So be sure to use this uh, whenever you can. So if you have a Grand Rapids Public Library card, you can use this interface at home uh, anytime you want. Um, if you don't have a library card, um, you can come into the library and uh, use it here, either on one of our own computers, or you can bring your own computer and just access it through our network, and you'll be able to, to get at that. So please do that. Uh, we also have just a ton of other online resources, uh, some of which are only available at uh, a specific Grand Rapids Public Library building. Um, that includes Ancestry.com library edition, which is super useful um, for these sorts of things. So uh, please come in. It's free to use, uh, and we're happy to, to let you use them. All right, and then let's go back here. Uh, I also want um, to highlight other digital resources. I won't go through all of them, but uh, just a, a wealth of information here. Um, and a lot of them come from different city, county, state, and federal governments uh, who have collected a bunch of this information. 
Um, but it's really valuable when you are researching your home. So be sure to check some of these out. And then I want to end uh, my little pr uh, promotion here with uh, a, a little. Uh, and then I want to end here with a little promotion for some of our in person resources. Now, as Heather mentioned, our real estate card collection is one of our most valuable resources. Uh, it consists of those three by five cards that she was using. If you are interested in using those, please just come on in and talk to whoever is at the desk and say you want to take a look and we will get you all set up. We also have a full collection of city directories, um, either on microfilm uh, or after 1958, we also have hard copies um, for uh, the city of Grand Rapids and some of the suburban directories uh, whenever they're available. We have an extensive plat map collection for researching property ownership for various year, years. And we also have vertical files of newspaper articles and other materials that are related first uh, to homes or buildings. And these are organized by street name, but then also on a host of other topics as well, which could be really valuable. If you want to see what those are from home, just go to our newspapers and indexes page and then um, scroll down here to subject files. Click there. That's going to give you a full list of all the different subjects uh, that those files cover. And then as you dig even deeper, and especially into the people who are associated with your house, you might find that one or more of our archival collections will be helpful for your research as it was for Heather. And while you do need to come in to be able to look at this material, um, you can search our finding aids from home so that you can be all set before you even come in and tell us what you're wanting to look at. Um, to do that, you go here to uh, this interface and it is accessible. Let me go back here so that you can see it. You go to archival collections here, click here, and then click on special collections interface. And it allows you to search across all of the collections. So you could do um, like American seating. Then it lists all the collections that might have material related to that. And then some of the actual individual items. So this is really helpful and valuable if you're trying to track down specific information. We have in our special collections, literally millions of photographs. We have uh, a large number of records related to Grand Rapids businesses, uh, important individuals and organizations, uh, and a bunch of material on the furniture industry as well. So. These are the highlights, but if you really want to dig in here, I'd encourage you to stop into the Grand Rapids History Center and see what you're able to discover. Thanks so much for watching. Thank you, Heather, again, and we'll hope to see you all soon. Take care.